A listener note, this story contains adult content and language. One morning, attorney David Latt was sitting in his apartment in D.C., flipping through the Sunday New York Times, when he arrived at his favorite part of the paper. I have to confess, I am a a devoted reader of the New York Times wedding announcements. Latt loves the wedding section, even though the vast majority of couples are total strangers to him. They are looking for people with impressive pedigrees. They are looking for people who are photogenic. But on that morning, he spotted a pair of familiar faces. They were both a very impressive, accomplished young lawyers. They were a very nice-looking couple. Uh, so if anyone was going to make it into those uh, pages, it was going to be Dan and Wendy. Lat began to read. Wendy Jill Adelson, the daughter of Donna Sue Adelson and Dr. Harvey J. Adelson of Coral Springs, Florida, is to be married this evening to Dan Eric Markell the son of Ruth Markell and Phil Markell of Toronto. The bride, 26, is keeping her name. I think it was the best wedding I've ever been to. Avery Kohler's was a high school buddy of Dan's. He made the trip to Boca Raton for the celebration, as did around 200 other friends and family members. The weather, perfect. The venue, extravagant. And at the center of all of it, the happy couple. Dan and Wendy danced for hours with their guests. It just felt like it was overflowing with, with joy and love. I mean, that, that sounds so corny. I actually uh, found an email I sent to Dan on March 4 of 2006. Uh, Hi, Dan. Congratulations and best wishes to you and Wendy. I'm sitting at home reading the Sunday Times, and lo and behold, uh, there you are. Uh, best, Dave. And it's funny, Dan actually responded because Dan was a very diligent email responder even though he was on his honeymoon. Greetings from Club Med, he wrote. And then I responded, you're checking email on your honeymoon, you truly are a cyber addict, I thought I was bad. Don't respond to this email, hope you're having a wonderful time. So what makes a good marriage anyway? I guess I would say that uh, crucial to a good marriage is mutual respect. Love, of course, but uh, also uh, respect. But as you can probably guess, this isn't a story about the happy ever afters, the lucky ones, the couples who grow more inseparable with age. Not even close. I have to be a little circumspect here because over the years I've become very familiar with the uh, libel laws of the United States. So um, mm, I, I'm, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't think I'm gonna give my personal view here. It's a story about the opposite, a bad marriage, a worse breakup, a brutal divorce. And he stormed out. And did he say something like, I told you you should never be marrying her? This is probably the biggest story I'll ever work on. Probably the biggest story in Tallahassee ever, I would say. And everything that came after. Somebody else fucking knows something because this shit would have not came out unless he told someone else. But there's nothing. I have never said to anyone that my mom is a dangerous person. Oh, are you saying that you think maybe one of your friends would have done something like <laughs> would this? Do this? From Wondery, I'm Matthew Share, and this is over my dead body. Baby, I'm guilty. I've got his blood on my hand. Baby, you're crazy. I never touched that man. I've been a magazine writer for about a decade now. And during that time, I've made a habit of keeping certain ideas in my back pocket. Ideas that I plan on returning to at some point down the line. But in the past couple years, one particular criminal case has taken up the bulk of my free time. A case that says at least as much about marriage and love as it does about revenge and justice, and the lengths we'll go to to get even. This season of Over My Dead Body is called Tally, and this is episode one, The Husband. 
Can I just tell him? Leonard Cohn is my is my cousin and William Shatner. Leonard Cohn died, but William Shatner was there. And he You know those couples him. who've known each other so long that when they tell stories, they can finish each other's sentences? Ruth and Phil Markell are just like that. On this particular afternoon, the Markells are sitting on a couch in a home in a leafy residential neighborhood of Toronto, telling stories about their son, Dan. He was very rambunctious, the furthest thing from a serious personality for him. How he got lost in a shopping mall as a boy. He went to the kiosk and he asked the lady, can I use your phone, please, uh, to call home? Because I lost my father. How he was ambitious, even as a teenager. By the time he was about 13, 13 and a half, he decided, no, I'm not going to be a rabbi, but I'm going to be the president of the synagogue. By high school, Dan was telling anyone who would listen that someday he was going to go to Harvard. I'll never forget when he got accepted. It was the most unbelievable thing. He was like on cloud 99. He was just so happy because he actually got what he really planned for a long, long time. Then he went on to Harvard Law School. After that, Dan clerked for a federal judge and landed a job at a prestigious law firm in D.C. He had determination and he knew what he wanted and he basically achieved everything. Dan had it all. But he still hadn't found anyone he wanted to spend the rest of his life with. He was looking for a family life. He, w- he was definitely looking for, uh, you know, like, let's call it like a settling. He was ready to settle down, as, as the expression goes. And children were definitely going to be a yeah, part of his part life, of his life without yeah. question. And then, one day, he met Wendy Adelson. She was a beautiful girl, a woman. Um... Warm. I mean, she was warm. She presented it herself was... as very warm. Dan and Wendy had found each other on J-Date. They exchanged messages, joked, flirted. Soon, he was introducing her to his parents. Dan was proud of Wendy's academic pedigree, which almost matched his. Magna cum laude from Brandeis, master's degree from Cambridge. She was seven years younger than Dan. When they met, she was at law school at the University of Miami. I mean, everything was very positive. There was absolutely no question or doubts in our minds. I mean, she, she's Jewish, she came from a Jewish family, originally from New York. Father was a dentist, the mother was whatever. School teacher. Uh, the, the kids, she had siblings, and everything was, I mean, what more can Jewish parents want from their kids? Dan and Wendy had started off long distance him in D.C., and her in Miami. But it was a rocket courtship. In May of 2005, Dan accepted a tenure-track job at Florida State University in Tallahassee, where he and Wendy planned to start a life together. That same month, the couple took a trip to Israel. In the village of Tiberias, overlooking the Sea of Galilee, Dan proposed and Wendy accepted. On his blog, Dan wrote, All I can say is wow. Did I win the lottery of life? A lot of other people thought so, too. As a couple, Dan and Wendy were charismatic. They played off each other's energy. It was Thursday night, September 1st, 2005. And I'm at this wedding. I'm a single guy. I'm on the dance floor, kind of feeling, like, lonely. And I I walk off the dance floor, and I'm just kind of strolling around this big hotel ballroom at the Pierre Hotel near Central Park in New York City. Zach Schreier knew Dan from Harvard. A uh, really attractive young lady um, stops me and she says, I recognize you from my fiance's Friendster page. Yeah, Friendster. This was the 2000s. It was like the pre-Facebook, Facebook kind of, but I guess nowhere near as successful. But her fiance apparently had a Friendster page and she recognized me as one of the friends in it. And I said, oh, who's your fiance? And she said, Dan Markell. So, of course, I was, you know, talking to Wendy and meeting her for the first time. Dan and Wendy wasted no time hatching a plan. They were going to set Zach up with one of Wendy's friends. Dan said, she's beautiful, she's Jewish, she's brilliant, she's got a great body. And, you know, and Wendy's kind of blushing and, like, you know, shut up. He goes, well, she does, and you have to meet her. So Wendy picks up her cell phone and calls Abigail and leaves a voicemail. And what did the voicemail say? 
She said, Abigail, stop dating. We found your Beshert. And Beshert is like your intended, as you probably know. And that was that. Zach lived in L.A. Abigail lived in Washington, D.C., thousands of miles apart. So what, Dan said. He'd done long distance, too, and look how it turned out. Abigail and I went on our first date, and that's the last first date I've ever been on. The Schreiers got married, and of course, the couple who introduced them were at the wedding. But Abigail didn't want to give Dan and Wendy too big of a role. There was always a fair amount of drama with the couple. I'm not a person who likes drama very much. The drama Abigail mentions, it was no small thing. Abigail says, at one point, Wendy told her she was thinking of breaking off her engagement with Dan. Wendy took me for a walk and said, you know, Dan had offended a friend of of Wendy's um, about his feelings about affirmative action. See, anyone who knew Dan knew that he never encountered an argument he wouldn't take up for sport. He wasn't even against affirmative action as a policy. He just liked to debate. He was posing hypotheticals to her, and he had really offended Wendy's friend. And she, she said she needed to go on a walk with me. We went on a walk, and she said, I don't know what to do. Can I love this? You know, basically, should I get back together with him? Apparently, Wendy decided she could. A few months later, she and Dan were married. Still, that drama, it didn't go away, even on Dan and Wendy's wedding day. Although the Markells and the Adelsons were both paying for the wedding, it was Wendy's parents who'd hired the caterer. Dan had wanted the wedding to be strictly kosher, but... When we arrived, the food was not kosher. And we noticed right away they had dairy and meat both being offered at the same time. And that's when we both kind of started to step away, like, what's... not sure what's going on here. The Markells were blindsided. Dan was going around to each of his guests who kept kosher, we do, and saying, I'm so sorry. Please don't eat the food. Um, It's not kosher. I'm so sorry. Dan had recruited a rabbi friend as officiant, and the catering put him in an especially awkward position with his buddy. The rabbi that he had asked to officiate had to leave the wedding at that point. Dan must have felt awful. But if he let the kosher mix up more than trip him up momentarily, Abigail didn't see it. And this is Dan. He went to every person who kept kosher and apologized to them personally. And then he ran right back to the dance floor and started dancing with her again. After the wedding, Dan and Wendy returned to Tallahassee, where Dan threw himself into life as an academic. He taught. He published papers. He traveled the country attending conferences. And it was at those conferences that fellow attorney David Latt would see him. Dan, uh, on the legal conference circuit, was something of a rock star. He appeared on many, many panels. Uh, He was a speaker, uh, often, I believe, a keynote speaker. Latt had been friends with Dan at Harvard, and now they found themselves running in the same circles again. Dan and I reconnected through legal blogging. Uh, I started two legal blogs. And Dan founded a very popular, influential law professor blog called Prof's Blog. Normally, Dan's blog dealt with the ins and outs of his legal theories of crime and punishment, or the latest developments on the courts. But in July of 2009, Dan had some more personal news to share. Wendy and I welcomed a little and delicious seven pound, five ounce baby boy into the world last night, Wednesday, at 10.58 p.m. Everyone is flourishing. The baby naming ceremony in Briss will take place next week on Thursday in the Hassie. More details to follow, but I'm using Facebook mobile to pepper the world with inanities and new pics. So if you're interested, follow Bam Bam's life journey there. With gratitude and blessings, Wendy Adelson and Danny Markell. Next to it, he posted a photo. Here's a pic of the little guy dreaming of whitefish salad and other smoked delicacies to come. If you were a regular reader of Prof's blog in those years, you would have gotten a picture that Dan and Wendy's marriage was, well, happy. When Wendy competed in a triathlon, Dan gushed about it. When Wendy wrote a novel, Dan promoted her book signing. On the blog, she was Osita, little bear in Spanish. Dan wasted no opportunity to fawn over her which struck even his close friends as a little over the top. It was really out there. It was really Dan. You know, it was was amazingly uncool. 
It was amazingly, you know, brash, but it was it was so unbelievably genuine that I, I kind of don't know how you couldn't have been disarmed by it. Even in person, Zach Schreier remembers the couple could engage in the kind of PDA that's usually reserved for teenagers. He literally jumps on Wendy um, on this bed and just sort of smothers her and starts like kissing her right in front of me on this bed in a way that was, you know, mostly just playful, not as wildly inappropriate as it sounds, but just kind of just sort of like ridiculous, funny drama, love. He was relentless in a certain sense. He was relentless with love. So then, imagine that you're Dan Markell. You're on a short business trip to New York. You get a call from your wife. She tells you she's leaving you. You cut your trip short. You're sure you can still convince her to reconsider. You get the first flight home. But as you open the door, you notice the house is weirdly quiet, echoey. It's never this quiet. Then you notice a lot of the furniture in the living room is gone. The kids' room, mostly empty. In fact, pretty much everything is gone, including your wife and the kids. You walk into your bedroom. The bed is still there. And on it, you see a stack of divorce papers. In re the marriage of Wendy Adelson, petitioner wife, and Dan Markell, respondent husband, petition for dissolution of marriage. Dan's parents, Ruth and Phil, came down the next day for a visit. Unfortunately, his whole home was totally devastated, and all of the children's clothing and the children's toys and bed and stuff like that were gone. Dan would later use a phrase from history to describe what he felt his wife had just done to him. Pearl Harbor. On December 7th, 1941, Japan, like its infamous Axis partners, struck first and declared war afterwards. Dan and Wendy had become close with a couple who lived near them in Tallahassee, Jeremy and Tracy Cohen. A day or two later, Dan went to see them. He was very angry. Yeah, he was, I mean... Very devastated. Yeah, uh, uh, emotional and, you know, upset, furious. Um, I mean, just overwhelmed by what had happened. And I think his way of processing was kind of talking through it. And he needed, you know, that you know, sounding board. And that's not a conversation where there was back and forth. It was, you know, two hours where he spoke for an hour and 58 minutes, probably. And um, I don't know, was still processing it. She didn't want to have to deal with that face-to-face conflict. And so it was easier for her to kind of separate herself, leave the papers behind, and, and never have to confront him. He had no clue. Really, though? Maybe Dan should have seen it coming. Last year, together with a reporter friend of mine, Eric Benson, I traveled down to Tallahassee to talk with some of the people who had known Dan and Wendy best. Basically everywhere we went, people told us, Tallahassee is sleepy. Tallahassee's quiet. Tallahassee is basically a village. Sure, it's the capital of Florida, but it's North Florida, a big difference from, say, the area around Miami. It feels more like the Deep South. Spanish moss, Humidity as thick as a blanket, bugs the size of your fist. Tracy and Jeremy Cohen live in one of the nicest neighborhoods in town. This is the neighborhood's called Benton Hills. Uh, if you look at the sign, it's modeled after the Beverly Hills sign, so it's uh, it has it has aspirations. Kind of suburban neighborhood. Yeah, They've been here a decade. They have two kids and run a small business together. But for the most part, it is uh, houses that were built in the 50s and 60s and 70s. So it's kind of a mix of older um, uh, retired couples and then more and more uh, young families with children. They ended up moving to this neighborhood, Benton Hills, where Dan and Wendy lived. We uh, had our first child in 2007, and then I guess met them shortly after that at a party. Right. Uh, we were still kind of in the mode of, of trying to you know, meet new people and meet new friends in Tallahassee. Wendy was charming, with blonde hair and big, bright blue eyes, which Tracy would later find out were enhanced with teal contacts. Dan was chatty and tense, with light brown hair and glasses. 
there was kind of a spark there, and we made we talked to each other pretty much the whole party, and made plans to hang out after that, and things started hanging out. It had been a job that brought their new friends to Tallahassee, Dan's job, and the law school had offered Wendy a teaching position too, on a contract basis. To get these attractive candidates like like Danny, the law school has often to accommodate their their, their spouses, right? And, and, and Tallahassee is a notoriously difficult place for that. Fernando Tesson is an Argentine diplomat and a retired member of the faculty at FSU's law school. He helped hire Dan. We're not New York, we're not Washington, we're not Chicago. There's not stuff that the, uh, the spouses can do. Tallahassee certainly wasn't Wendy's first choice, but she tried to make do. In order to please Danny, gave her a clinical job. And I think that in that job, she did pretty well. She connected with the people who do human trafficking, and she did pretty well there. Her performance, I think, exceeded a little bit expectations. Over time, Dan and Wendy became a kind of Tallahassee power couple. A lot of Fridays, Dan and Wendy hosted big Shabbat dinners in their home. He and Wendy loved pulling together people from the Jewish community, but also outside the Jewish community, and sharing this meal with a pretty broad array of really interesting people. But the Coens also saw the cracks in the relationship. A bunch of small couple-type things, like arguments over chores. I could see him being a tough guy to be married to. But he was not the person who mowed the lawn, right? He didn't do a whole lot of dishes. But there were some bigger issues, too. Ones that dated back to their wedding day. They were very careful about keeping a kosher home. I will say, Wendy broke that every once in a while, um, and I think that was a point of contention between the two of them. But, um, but for Danny, he took it very seriously. Their friend Abigail Schreier says that Dan's Jewish identity mattered to him a lot. He was a very thoroughly Jewish guy. It's sort of hard to convey that sometimes, but he, he really was. It's something that was in his bones. For example, Dan believed he was a Kohen, a member of the Jewish priestly class. He took that role seriously. One of the strictures is if you're a Kohen, you're not supposed to visit a grave site. You, you can go to a funeral, but you're not actually supposed to sort of, as far as I know, defile yourself by going to the, the grave site. Wendy, she didn't quite accept the sacrifices that came with that. Her grandmother died. And he said, I'm sorry, I can't go. I think this was their first year of marriage. And she and her, from what he told me, she and her family could not understand this. How could you possibly do this to my grandmother? How could you do this to us? Why wouldn't you go? Around this time, Wendy also started to work on a novel. It was called This Is Our Story. She asked her friend Tracy for help editing it. And when Tracy read the manuscript, she was surprised to find that major parts of the novel appeared to be pretty nakedly autobiographical. Tallahassee had been redubbed Hiawassee Springs. The attorney narrator was Lily, not Wendy. But still, the rest seemed awfully familiar. In the novel, Lily hates her adopted city of Hiawassee Springs. Here's how she describes her arrival there. It was pouring rain, which was just as well because it obscured the fact that Hiawassee Springs was, shall we say, less than I expected. It's my own fault, really, not having done enough research. I just assumed, and we all know what assuming does, that Hiawassee Springs was in Florida and would be just like other parts of Florida I knew. Lily, Lily, Lily. I definitely found out how wrong you can be with assumptions. By all accounts, Wendy was not a fan of Tallahassee. She would have been happier in Miami, where her passion for immigration law would be put to better use, and where she could be closer to her extended family. Except for one brother who lived outside Florida, the close-knit Adelson clan lived and worked around Miami. But there's more than just hating Tallahassee. The Lily character in Wendy's novel also fears she's become trapped in a broken marriage. Did I even love him anymore, Lily thinks to herself? Or did I just love the idea of being attached to something, knowing that I was moving in one particular direction? I was lost without a clear idea of where I might be headed. My time is precious and I won't spe- waste it reading that novel, but people who have read it said it's a piece of crap. Dan dutifully promoted the novel on his blog. But to close friends, he was less positive. 
Danny was intellectually very rigorous. And my suspicion, this is complete speculation on my part, you have to understand, is that he thought it was crap and he that, and, and, and did not deserve intellectual respect. I think, you know, Danny is a true scholar, right? And to his research meant a lot to him. He was very well respected in the field. Uh, and um, that was not an academic piece of literature, right? And so I think he, Danny kind of turned his nose up a little bit at that. And um, yeah, he said he, he didn't read it. And he's kind of wasn't interested in reading it because it wasn't the type of book that he would want to read. The novel was eventually published. Dan still never read it. Which was a mortal wound for Wendy. It really hurt her feelings. Yeah, you think about that. Your wife pours her heart and soul into this book that's gotten pretty broad acclaim, and it, he feels like he didn't want to take the time out to read it. I mean, that's, that would hurt me. If you're married to somebody and that somebody does something or says something or publishes something worthless, what are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> I think take, take the two and a half hours and read it. <laughs> That's my colleague Eric Benson talking with Sison. Yeah, he could have said that and then told her that it was crap. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah, right. Not having read it was not like the best marital thing to do. Dan and Wendy had had what seemed, on the outside, like a storybook romance. Whirlwind courtship, picture-perfect engagement, lavish wedding, but in the book, Lily's attitude towards love seems more transactional. I see dating at its best as nothing more than a romantic interview. Are you the kind of person who would produce good looking, smart and nice children and never cheat on me and help me clean up the kitchen and love me even when I'm grouchy and not trade me in for a younger model and not join the other team? The real life Wendy had gotten some of those things by marrying Dan. Successful in his career, a couple of kids, not so much on the cleaning the kitchen part. And Dan wasn't completely clueless about Wendy's dissatisfaction. During that time, Dan and Wendy visited their friends, the Schreiers in Los Angeles. I remember Dan saying to Zach, don't you wish you asked a lot more questions before you got married or something like that. But he was also confident he could make it work. Dan sort of feels like if there's a problem, he just needs to you know, punch past it, get past it. That was my, always my impression of him. An obstacle was just an excuse for not getting things done. And I think he felt that way in the relationship too. Wendy, meanwhile, was moving in a very different direction. She'd had enough of living in a city she hated. She had a plan. She was gonna get a lawyer, book moving trucks, fill out divorce papers. And then she was gonna take her two boys and get the hell out of Tallahassee. A couple weeks before Pearl Harbor, Wendy and Dan went on a trip with some friends, including their neighbors, the Coens. We took a beach trip with uh, ourselves uh, our families and the um, Markel Adelsons, another couple and their kids, and then the two of us and our children. And we went to, I think, St. George. St. George for the day. And um, while we were sitting at a cafe. On that trip, Wendy shared something with Tracy Cohen. Wendy told m me and the other friend that she was planning on leaving Danny uh, within a couple weeks. And she had the date picked out and um, she let us know that that was imminent. Tracy told me after that weekend and kind of swore me to secrecy. Jeremy Cohen thought about saying something to Dan. I, I, looking back, I definitely could have been a better friend there and uh, could have stepped in and um, shared that or, or done something. After the split, Dan would vent about Pearl Harbor to any friend who'd listen. I heard about people he ran into like in the airport and they're like, so how are things going? He's like, da -da 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 -da, and you know, went down the story of very personal, hurtful thing that had, had happened to him, and he laid it all out there for a lot of other people to, to, to hear. So I said, well, there was another woman. That's the first thing I think. And she says, no. So what I don't imagine, it wasn't any abuse or anything. No, of course, no abuse, no alcohol, no drugs, no infidelity. Did she have somebody, maybe a guy and a boyfriend? No. And I could not for my life 
get from him a coherent a thing that was a hundred percent persuasive about the cause of the breakup. He said that she resented him because he was like this kind of a tenured superstar or something, and what she didn't feel like she was at his level and resented that. And then she wrote this novel. Yeah, that novel again. Maybe if Dan had read it all the way through, he would have gotten a stronger hint of what was coming. At the very end, the character Lily finds her purpose through her work, adopts a baby one of her immigrant clients must give up for adoption, and ends up separated from her husband. There are many bad things about being a lawyer, I'm sure, but one thing about being a lawyer is that we are trained to hear both sides. So I always told Danny, when he was telling me all these bad things, I said, well, okay, Danny, if Wendy was here, what would she say? Well, she said she would say that she could not stand be with me with Tala in Tallahassee, that she felt frustrated within the marriage because I didn't respect her, blah, blah, blah. She would say that to me when I asked him about what would be Wendy's story, but I never got Wendy's story. Dan blasted out an email to a bunch of his friends. He sent out an email about how devastated he was, how determined he was to get Winner back and make it work, how confounded he was by what was going on. And he concluded it with, love mightily while you can. And that was very Dan to turn it and then just wish the best for the rest of us. Tell us like what we should be doing and hope for the best. Abigail picked up the phone and called Dan. She led with a joke, a callback to the fact that he and Wendy had been the ones who'd set her up successfully with her husband. Dan, I've got the girl for you. Dan laughed. But as they talked, she could hear how broken he was. He, he started to cry, and he said to me, what's going to happen with my boys? He said, their connection to Yiddishkeit, uh, to Judaism, is already so attenuated. What's going to become of them? And I had never, I'd never heard Dan cry. It was really heartbreaking. For two weeks after she left him, Wendy didn't even tell Dan where she and the boys were living. So he would wait for Wendy at their kid's school, at morning drop-off, and afternoon pickup. I think that was one way of kind of seeing her, and he'd try to like, you know, figure out when she was going to be there and be in the parking lot to try to you know, confront her. But not legal confrontation. Not yet. Because Dan was still holding on to the hope, however distant, that he could woo Wendy back. He could make the family whole again. It didn't take long for friends like the Coens to start choosing sides. So there was definitely a Team Wendy and a Team Danny, and we were on Team Danny you know, from the beginning. And um, I mean, I, I was. And uh, I think, you know, it's a function also of he lived on our street. Our kids went to school together and we're roughly the same age. Hoping that you will stay. I had one divorce from my first wife many years ago. And as you know, in these divorce issues, people take sides. And I decided, by much as I liked Wendy, right, because I still liked her, you know, I, 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 I mean, Danny had chosen me as one of his confidants. So I was not entitled, I thought, to go back to her and talk to her. I thought that that was not uh, consistent with my role as Danny's friend. For a guy who really liked to be in control, things had gotten a little out of control for him in, a, in an unpleasant way. Like, not that he was a c control freak. I don't mean to suggest that he wasn't, but this was not the plan um, in any way. Wendy may have been relieved to escape a marriage that made her unhappy, but striking out on her own turned out to be not so simple. As it became increasingly clear to Dan that he was never getting Wendy back, his attitude changed. Yeah, I mean, I'd say that there were two phases to the post-divorce life for Danny. You know, the first phase was him, it was immediately after this Pearl Harbor moment where she dropped the papers on the bed, and he was committed to winning her back. And when it was clear that that wasn't happening, then he shifted into the second phase, which was fighting it like hell. Dan Markell became famous in the legal world, in part due to his unique theories on crime and punishment. 
which he often discussed on his blog. To Dan, a big part of why we punish criminals is to reinforce the unspoken pact we all have as a society. Dan was taking the side that, no, it's a positive good for offenders to to suffer uh, in the course of being punished because that's part of how uh, we write the scales. That's his law school colleague, Mark Spotswood. That's part of how we signal to them that, you know, we, you, what you did was wrong and you as a sort of equal moral member of society uh, deserve to be held to account for that. So, and I'm summarizing here, Dan's theories are building on one of the oldest ideas around, that justice is all about getting even. So once the gloves were off, once it was clear their marriage was never going back to how it was, how would Dan and Wendy get what they wanted? You live in, you know, the the modern world where most of us are, you know, pretty safe, and then completely out of the blue, someone walks into the garage and shoots them in the face. If anything, it's like, okay, a robbery, all right, drugs, okay, but a murder, like, I would never, like, ever be expecting that. That's bullshit, man. You know exactly what I'm talking about. We know what the fuck is going on. Find out who the fuck it is. That's all I'm asking you. That's on this season of Over My Dead Body. From Wondery, This is part one of six of Over My Dead Body, a story about love, death, and family. Over My Dead Body was written and reported by me, Matthew Scher, and Eric Benson. Sound design by Jeff Schmidt. Associate producer is Chris Siegel. Executive produced by George Lavender, Marshall Louie, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering.